attack of the killer tomatoes. They'll beat you, bash you, squish you, mash you, chew you up for brunch, and finish you off for dinner or lunch. Ah, yes. Thanks to YouTube. I had to bring that one back as we're talking tomatoes. <laughs> the Tomato King, have you ever seen that movie, Steve? Uh, I have not, but I've heard about it many times. It's a silliest darn movie. Go to YouTube and put in uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. A, a one-time assemblyman was involved in the making of this movie, and it's just the funniest thing. The tomatoes come out of the garbage disposal, and this woman is screaming, Oh, my gosh, the tomato is going to get me. <laughs> but I think it's more like the Attack of the Hornworm. We're going to scream at that. But let's first talk about, I know you're big um, as a nurseryman and a lecturer. You're all about organic gardening practices uh, with your tomatoes. So talk a bit about that, and then that will segue us into how we can be organic but also cure some of these problems that we diagnose in our garden. Yeah, I've, uh, I'm a retired nurseryman, and I, for years and years and years we used uh, non-organic fertilizers, commercial fertilizers, and didn't know why we were having a lot of the different problems and issues that we had, especially in our soils. And I had mentioned earlier in the program that when it comes to growing tomatoes, soil is everything. If your soil is not, if it doesn't provide for the plant, then obviously your plant's not going to be very, very happy. So with organic growing, we're finding out, and we've known this for many, many years, is that the soil has to be alive. And what's alive in the soil that makes it alive is physically the microbes or the bacteria that lives in the soil. And without the bacteria, there is no organics. So, you know, when we're talking about organic growing and organic farming, the first thing we have to address is the life in the soil itself. And once we have that in the soil, plant your tomatoes, and the soil will provide everything that the plant needs without having to worry about, oh, we have to keep fertilizing every, every month or every week, a couple of weeks, because that is a regimen of a non-organic fertilizer. Um, we have fertilizers at this time, organic fertilizers at this time, that we can apply to the soil and have to only uh, and apply it only once every six months. Oh, wow. That's huge. And so that's kind of a time-saving factor. Is it kind of a systemic? Is that what? It, yeah. They're, they're all slow release. Yeah, yeah. Uh, depending on what materials that they actually are derived from. Some are, some are animal parts. This one that I'm talking about is totally uh, vegetable. It uh, comes from Europe, and it's physically the byproduct of the penicillin industry, which uh, has other benefits, but there is no penicillin in this product. But as a lawn fertilizer and as a tomato fertilizer, you know, I only have to do it once a year, once a season. And uh, I love it because I don't have to go out there and worry about the feeding. The, the soil, once I fed it, it feeds the plant and just continuously, continually feeds the plant. And then you're more successful, huh? Is uh, extremely successful yeah. because you're increasing the, vol- the, the, the virility of the soil itself. Every year you put more of this product in, the soil gets stronger and stronger and stronger. All right. We will make a note of that. Well, let's help us with some of the different problems that I think we all kind of uh, from time to time encounter with tomatoes. Um, Let's say that it looks like the blossom itself is rotting. Uh, That could be a nutrition deficiency, um, or it also could be you're overwatering your plant or underwatering your plant Mm -hmm. or just simply temperature. When you have a, a situation where you overwater your plant, uh, the plant itself is under stress, and if the plant cannot hold the fruits of maturity, first of all, it won't, it won't pollinate and won't produce a fruit. But uh, once the uh, pollen inside the fruit or inside the flower has been sterilized, then the plant is going to abort that flower because obviously it takes energy to, to keep that flower going. And uh, then it focuses its energy to the new set of flowers that are going up there. But in that, in that uh, system, systemic uh, growing system, um, it will drop the flower if it is no longer viable. And if we don't have the flower, we're not going to get a tomato, no right? No tomato, exactly. And that leads us to pollination, right? So we yeah. want to make sure that the bees are coming and helping with our tomatoes. Yeah, that or, you know, if you, um, uh, one of the things I like to do, because we have bees and we have flies and, and there's the birds and there's other things that do pollinate the plants themselves, and they're all good, they're all good. Um, I actually like to wash my plants uh, maybe once or twice a week. I hit it with a stream of water, and that will help pollinate it. Or just basically, uh, you know, if you have uh, wind that's blowing through your yard, or, or if you're tying up or staking up your tomatoes or pruning your tomatoes, every time you bump into the plant, you're physically pollinating at that. Oh, so my dogs are pollinating the plants. Yeah, very possibly, yeah. Because <laughs> they're always putting their rump right about right in front oh, of the plant. <laughs> the old, yeah, old English sheepdogs. In fact, I think that, I think I've even caught them trying to nibble on some of the tomato leaves. What's yeah. up with that? Yeah, well, they, I don't know. I think it's the, it's the scent, but they like, they, like the, they like the scent. We have neighbors across the street that are physically pulling at the plants uh, continuously at the tips. Huh. Interesting. 
All right. Well, how about yellow leaves? That sounds like that's overwatering, but what else could it be? It could be underwatering also. And you will know if you're overwatering, underwatering. But uh, some of the common problems that we've uh, uh, had this year, because we've had a cool, wet spring and a extended uh, uh, late spring, uh, that was cool, and it's usually blight. Blight is a, is a disease that, uh, that will attack the plant, and uh, sometimes you'll see a little spotting on the foliage also, mm-hmm. and that's just telling you that, yeah, you, you've uh, contracted the disease and that it will be, you know, it's, it's detrimental to the plant if you let it progress. But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about blight is that, and people have to realize this, um, as the plant grows, all new foliage is being produced at the tip of the plant, so is the flower. If the, when the plant's... Um, 60 days old, uh, and maybe about four or five feet tall, you have to understand that the foliage at the bottom of the plant has already done, it, done, it, it's, done its job. Okay. And the energy that is being provided to that bottom leaf is no longer being focused there. It's actually being focused to the top. And that plant is, at that point, going to abort that foliage. And there's, especially at this particular time, you're going to see a lot of yellowing and black spotting because since the leaf doesn't have resistance, while the disease is going to attack that foliage. And if you do see that, it's not a bad thing. It's not killing your plant. But what you may want to do is remove it, discard it, and there are organic fungicides that you can spray on the plant itself uh, to enhance the growth of the foliage, but then also to keep the bacteria from spreading. How about uh, shiny, sticky, and deformed leaves? Shiny, sticky, and deformed leaves is a really good sign of a uh, uh, pest problem maybe called aphid. I think we've all seen aphids look green, black, or rust-colored bugs that suck on the foliage and live on the other side of the leaf, or maybe white flies. Uh, they leave an excrement, which are shiny and sticky. And if you have that issue, there are insecticides out there, organic insecticides, that I like to recommend that are physically uh, uh, derived from herb, herb uh, oils like uh, thyme and clove and mm-hmm. garlic and th- those type of things, mm-hmm. cinnamon oil. There's a lot of those for our whole, to, to kind of appease our, our veggie gardening bug. Yeah, <laughs> right? they're, they're very, very effective. There yeah. are also pyrethrins, which are derived from chrysanthemum flowers that are very effective in controlling those pests. Or even if you made, like if you were just to get some soapy water, would that just be the same technique? Um, well, I, I like the oils because, especially like with the clove and the garlic oil, they physically work on the nervous system of the pests themselves and mm. have a lot better, um, um, I'm not going to say kill ratio, but, you know, <laughs> just the ability to uh, wipe out the insects without having to reapply. Gotcha. Um, that's another thing, too, is that, you know, these organic insecticides, they don't have a lot of residual left, so you have their contact sprays. You have to shoot them and kill them while they're there. Mm-hmm. How about when the tomato is still on the vine and it's splitting or it's cracking? Um, two different issues, uh, overwatering and high temperature, and that could be either night temperature or day temperature. Um, if you're watering infrequently or if you're doing it evenly, not throwing a lot down every single day, and then the temperature rises, uh, that will cause splitting. Um, with the heirloom varieties, though, interesting enough, I'm finding out that there's really not too much you can do about the splitting regardless of how it's growing. But it's a genetic thing with heirloom varieties. I see. Okay. So you just have to kind of go with the flow with a, with a heirloom tomato. Okay. How about um, we're seeing brown patches on the leaves? That's uh, another form of blight or another type of yeah. disease. Yeah. All right. And, and also that could uh, uh, be, if you see black, brown patching or a leathery patch on your tomatoes, that could be sunburn. Okay. And then if we, well, what we do about that then? I guess we just have to... We're, we're watering it from above, and it's getting burnt that way? No, that has, uh, that has no bearing on the, that type of problem. Uh, basically, physically, uh, you don't have enough of a cape or canopy over the top oh. of the tomato to protect it. Okay. So it's a, a matter of pruning. If you're pruning your plant too much, that could cause it. Uh, if, you, if you have an issue where it is too hot, just shade it. Um, go to the retailer and find a, a net that will protect the plant from They have these uh, uh, percentages, 50%, 70%. Get a 50% net that'll block out 50% of the sun and build a, just a cover over the top of it and shade it. That's Get a parasol. Fun. Your tomato needs a parasol. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What about the, the darn tomato hornworm? What's the latest to get that bugger? Uh, we have some really neat things out on the market right now that are extremely effective. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, within the last 20 years, we've been using a product called Bracillus thuringiensis, if I pronounce that correctly. 
Uh, it's a bacteria that physically uh, works within the stomach lining inside the tomato and causes it to stop eating physically on the vine. But you know that one tomato can eat a, uh, about 40 to 60 percent of your tomato plant in one day. Uh, they're very voracious. So in order for this product to go into the, the worm system, they have to continually eat and eat that product, which is on the foliage. You spray it on the foliage. The new thing that's out on the market right now, completely organic, which is great, is a byproduct of the sugarcane industry. It's, it's uh, sugarcane waste. Hmm. And uh, uh, it's called spinosad, manufactured by three or four major labels at this time. And what's really, it's a stomach poison. And uh, when you, if you spray it, on them, it will actually penetrate their outer outer shell and then obviously kill them that way. But if they ingest it, it'll also kill them too. Uh, it'll kill the hornworms, any worm, and any insect with a chewing mouth part. It's a fabulous, fabulous product. And not you don't have to worry about your insects. Uh, I'm sorry, your your pets or your you know people eating it. Um, obviously, you could spray and eat it the same day. Just wash the product before you eat it. I don't want to keep that from my monarch caterpillar, though. Uh, no, it will kill them. I don't want yeah. that because I'm, I'm, do, I'm. Hey, you, you got to see the pictures of our monarch. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been, I've been monitoring your, your Facebook page. Isn't it fun? Uh -huh. Have you done that before with the milkweed? I, I have not. I'm unfortunately because I have the tomatoes. I'm into actually eradicating yeah. the caterpillar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we have one more segment with you, uh, Tomato King. We're going to talk about uh, one of your uh, passions, and that's uh, the grafted new varieties that aren't as finicky as some of the heirlooms, and and just some fun. Uh, tomatoes to try in your garden. Home Wizard Cindy Dole talking with a Tomato King, and we're back right after this on KFWB News Talk 980. Welcome back. Cindy Dole here, where we love to help you figure out a way to just enjoy when you go home, whether it's an apartment or a condo or a house, whatever it is, we want you to feel good there and that's what we do every Saturday to help you improve your spaces and improve your life. And we're talking about something that's going to instantly make you feel good, and that's just growing your own tomatoes. Uh, the Tomato King, Steve Gatto, is with us, and he knows. Because how many years have you been doing this tomato thing? Oh, almost 30 years. 30 years, and it, it, it basically is in your blood because your, your parents did this, right? Uh, no, they didn't do tomatoes. They were nursery people. Um, I'm third generation. They had a nursery, I think, uh from my grandfather to I took it over, we were almost 60 years. Yeah, and so you just got the bug for tomatoes? How did that all happen? Um, it was uh, actually by demand of the customers. Uh, when I was in a nursery business, you know, I was selling uh, bedding plants, basically annuals and perennials, and we did some tomatoes, but we had a, a large customer here in California that was looking for something more unusual and something that nobody else did. And they introduced me to some of these varieties, and I'm thinking to myself, why the heck does anybody want to eat a purple tomato? I grew them, and it grew from there. It grew from five varieties to ten varieties to forty to eighty to. Right now, I'm I well, we grew up to three thousand different varieties of uh, tomatoes. Of those three thousand, we identified nine hundred that we put in our catalog for distribution in California. Very fun, and it seems like people really enjoy the the quirky, you know, the offbeat as well as the tried and true. You know, when you get hooked on heirloom tomatoes, you're always looking for the bigger and better. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly right. They're looking for something that's going to be something different. They're looking for something with a little bit of a history to it. And you'll find that a lot of these varieties have a lot of history to them. Well, and on your website, which is gotomato.us.com, you have your 20 top picks. And you were saying that one of the tomatoes is like an M&M? There is a variety of tomato. Now, unfortunately, this is not an heirloom variety. It's a hybridized variety, but it came out in 1988, and it's called Sun Gold Cherry. I think uh, a lot of your listeners will know it if they're growing tomatoes, but it has the highest sugar content that any tomato can have. The, uh, the BRICS level is the, is the way that they measure the amount of sugar, and it has a BRICS level of 10 out of 10. Uh, it's, it's so sweet. It has such a high sugar content that you might think that it's candy and it's not tomatoes. We have people come to our tastings, and they'll, they'll try them and thinking they're, they're, they're thinking, well, where's that kick? Where's that acid? Well, there is, there is the, the acid's there, but the sugar really masks the acidity. It's that, that high of a sugar content. Wow. And that, again, it's called what again? Sun Gold Cherry. Sun Gold Cherry. But then you also have the Black Cherry. I'm looking at a picture of it right now. Black Cherry is something that uh, some of that wants a little bit more full-bodied. Extremely sweet, not as sweet as the sun gold, but it'll have that acidity and a very, very complex type of a flavor to it. Um, for those of you that just like a regular cherry that really don't want the sugar, 
uh, in the cherry, a black cherry is a perfect uh, is a perfect replacer for that. And you also mentioned that there's a, a great tomato that you love, the Cherokee chocolate. Yeah, we talked about Cherokee purple earlier, and one of the things, uh, one of the complaints that uh, a lot of the, my customers have is they always tell me, Jesus Christ, this thing is really, really ugly. And because it cracks all the time, you think that maybe there's something wrong with the tomato. Uh, but the flavor is there, so it obviously overcomes some of the abnormalities of the tomato. But a new variety, which is, uh, I, I, it's been about six years now that it's been introduced, it's called Cherokee Chocolate, exactly the same as a Cherokee Purple, but um, it doesn't split. And in the last four years, we actually did our tastings, and we ballot all of our tomatoes. And believe it or not, for a black variety, came in number one over Cherokee Purple. Hmm. Well, all of these pictures, I'm going to put this on our website to share, as well as people going to your website, gotomato.us.com, and the, the top 20 picks for 2011. I mean, they're all just gorgeous. I mean, oh. I think that they photograph beautifully, tomatoes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they really do. Like, I like the one that has the little um, wh- yellow and, and red stripes. What do you call that? The copia? Uh, copia. It's yeah. a bi- bicolor. Yeah. Bicolors, uh, especially in the Southern California area, are extremely popular. You know, they're a, a departure from your traditional red uh, variety, but they'll have a uh, orangey or a yellow base to it with striping of pink, yellow, and uh, and orange. Mm-hmm. And you'll find that the sugar content, because it is a yellow or an orange variety, is going to be a lot higher than a red red variety tomato. And then there's the green zebra. That's kind of odd looking. Green zebra is one of the perennial favorites. Is um, it? it? Yeah, it actually has the striping, well, kind of like a zebra. Um when it's green, uh, the it's dark green, light green, with a little speckling throughout it. Uh, a lot of people are kind of hesitant about buying green tomatoes. They may think that a green tomato is going to be bitter and maybe a little bit on the sour side. Uh, and also, the biggest reason why is because most people don't know when a green tomato is ripe. Mm-hmm. How do you know? How, how do you know? Well, if you look at this picture, if you notice that uh, in between the dark striping, uh-huh. it has a shade of yellow to well, it. Little speckles a bit. Right, uh-huh. exactly. As the sugar content builds up in the tomato itself, the uh, skin will produce kind of a golden yellow orangey cast to it. And that's how you can tell if it's nice. ready. How about the Hawaiian pineapple? That doesn't taste like pineapple. Uh, no, it doesn't taste <laughs> like pineapple, but it's extremely sweet. This is uh, the best picture that I, I had. Um, generally, they, they may have a little bit of a, a spotting towards the flower end of uh, spotting, meaning a red orange or pinkish blush to it. I got my inspiration from uh, uh, pineapple. There's a, uh, a large uh, tomato uh, tasting uh, festival that they have up in the Monterey area. And uh, the years that I went there, I think it was 2000, 2001, or 2002, Hawaiian pineapple rated number one in flavor of all 400 different varieties that were there. Really? Now, remember, sugar is everything. And sugar is the uh-huh. flavor of the tomato. Yeah. That's because with a big tomato, you couldn't believe how sweet that tomato was. It looks gorgeous. It's fabulous. I can, I can, I can just imagine that in the salsa too. It looks great. Oh, all believe these. me, it does. <laughs> How about the Snow White? I mean, these are really kind of cool. They're ivory and they're the, they're the shape of a cherry tomato. Uh, a cherry tomato with a, just a little bit of a different uh, fling to it. You know, it's a, uh, a sugar content that is not as uh, sweet as a sun gold cherry. But again, you have people that will have the, the flavor or the taste for a sun gold because it is real sweet. Some of us um, older generation folk like myself, uh, maybe we like the sweet occasionally, but in a salad maybe we don't want it as sweet, and we'll actually switch over to a Snow White because it is, it's just a little bit more tame. Mm-hmm. And then what's this below it? There's a picture of something that's kind of drooping down. It's called the sausage. <laughs> it's it's a, a paste tomato. You know, most of us think a paste tomato looks kind of like a blocky little, uh, well, it could look like a sausage, but most of the time they can also look like an upside-down pear. And um, uh, sausage itself is an outstanding uh, uh, tomato that doesn't have a real high acid content, so it's a lot better for canning. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the flavor on it, when you eat it fresh off the vine, is much different than, you know, obviously you're not going to find something good at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But the flavor off of aroma tomato, especially this variety, is excellent right off the vine. When you mention acid, I mean, there's some friends of mine who'll say, you know, I can't have tomatoes because it just bothers me. It's too acidic for my system. Is there a certain tomato that you'd suggest that we try to grow that would be less acidic and that we could get away with and not have a problem? Well, first thing, there is no such thing as a low acidic or a less acidic tomato. Oh, okay. Yeah, the pH on all the tomato varieties are all the same. 
the difference between the different varieties is the sugar content. Oh, I see. And with like a Sun Gold Cherry, because it has such a high sugar content, it has a tendency to mask the acidity. Now, uh, now going back to this person that may have issues with uh, you know, the acid in the tomato, we've had people that have eaten like great white, snow white cherry, sun gold cherry, and because of the high sugar content, maybe, I don't know if it's the sugar, I don't really know what it is, mm. but these people have actually... goes down easier, maybe, huh? Yeah, they've, they've contacted me and said, you know what, I've eaten these tomatoes, and they seem to agree with me a lot more. Nice, good to know. Well, Stephen, you were saying that the grafted tomatoes really are quite a bit less finicky. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, what they've done is, uh, this technology has been around since the 20s, and the uh, Asian countries and European countries have been using grafted tomatoes uh, to to put uh, grow in their commercial farms uh, since after the war. So it isn't anything new. Recently, uh, there's been a, a grower up in Oregon that has uh, made the, that availability um, uh, available to us here in Southern California. And these grafted tomatoes, what they've done is they've taken a wild rootstock and have taken any hybridized variety or any heirloom variety that's available right now and actually grafted it onto the top of this rootstock. Well, cool. Well, that's to have everyone go to your website. It's gotomato.us.com. The Tomato King, Steve, great to have you with us. Well, thank you for having have me. Have you back Cindy. very soon. I'm inspired to grow some of these beautiful new tomatoes. Do check out on his website. He has his uh, top 20 of the 2011 picks. Coming up next Saturday, we're going to talk with a barbecue chef on how to make sure that the barbecue you have is going to perform for you so you can really impress when you're entertaining and bed bugs ew how to get rid of them home wizards next saturday two to four have a great weekend go to the website and remember this until next time the key is under the mat bye bye i'd say that was a pretty successful broadcast